Hello everyone, today is Tuesday, April 17th. A uh, couple of things I want to mention first. Um, the drop deadline passed, um, so for those of you who are still in this class, that means you're locked in. Whatever grade you get from this class, it's, it's final now. It's not possible to drop or withdraw from the class anymore. Um, another thing to consider is that I've given you guys a research paper extension, which means that instead of being due on the 22nd, it is now due the 29th. So you, you have an extra week now, so I would recommend that you, you make use of that time. Okay. Um, today's uh, integrity lecture is going to cover um, some more things about the research paper, the research presentation. Uh, if you're here for more instructions about the research paper, you can find all the instructions you need in the week 12 uh, integrity lecture. Um, again, you can go to the integrity classes and here's the week 12 one. You can look that up. There's also a YouTube link uh, that you can uh, access in the week 12 folder. But for now, I'm not going to cover the research paper instructions. Instead, I'm going to look at some sample essays and take a look at how uh, students from my previous semester did and, and, and what they did well. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to open up this student sample uh, right here. Uh, this was written by, uh, again, a former student from last semester, and she was talking about the Rio Grande Valley specifically. Um, and this, again, she got an, an A+. Plus, and let's, I want to really talk about why and sort of highlight what worked, what, uh, what sort of liberties did the student take to try to make her point. Uh, so I really want to do a, a sort of analysis of this paper to see, you know, how each of these parts kind of works together to make a really great paper. Um, so first off, she uh, titles it, I think, very clearly. She says that this is an analysis of the effects of multicultural society on minority cultures within them or therein. Um, so already off the bat, we know that it's going to be an analysis, not an argument, and her introduction, I think, is, is really great because she weaves together not just the context, like, you know, sort of the background information, but she also in introduces uh, certain problems and questions that arise without really asking questions. Um, so I'm going to read this first paragraph with you. This is the only paragraph I'm going to read with you, but we're still going to go through the whole paper. So bear with me, okay? She says, when thinking of the Rio Grande Valley, most people do not often think of a multicultural society. In fact, for most residents of the southernmost tip of Texas, the Rio Grande Valley is predominantly seen as a place in which overarching American culture combines with a local imported Mexican heritage, making the region appear to be, at most, a bicultural society. However, for a small number of people, this is a place where multiple cultures combine, merging to create a setting in which children from the Middle East Indian subcontinent and the Far East grow up with their respective cultures while adopting those around them, thus creating, for a few, a multicultural society. So notice so far, all she's done is sort of narrow down the context. So she didn't start off with like, well, this is what multicultural societies are. She doesn't give this really big, broad definition. She gets right to the focus, which is the Rio Grande Valley. Um, she also sort of paints this picture of, you know, what most people tend to think um, of the Rio Grande Valley. It's like, well, it's not really, like, it's not one culture. It's definitely more than one, but it's just two, right? It's American and Mexican, and that's it. Well, that's not necessarily the case either, um, as she puts it, right? For a lot of people, especially, you know, people from the Middle East, subcontinent, and the Far East, here in the Valley, you know, they're actually bringing in their own cultures too, Okay, so this is what she calls the phenomenon of multicultural societies. And she says they have dominant societies within them. They may cause pivotal facets of cultures to change so much that subordinate cultures, right, the smaller cultures, may at their cores lose some of the aspects that define them. So research will prove whether or not multicultural societies and the dominant cultures within them suppress single foreign cultures within those societies thus suppressing the natural rights of the people adhering to them. Uh, so she's looking, she's going to take uh, several, you know, articles and take a look at what some of the arguments, some of the research has been on multicultural societies and see how that affects the Rio Grande Valley specifically. Uh, but before she does that, in fact, she says, before beginning this analysis, she wants to sort of limit uh, what the definitions are going to be. So she um, 
uses uh, this author, Enzo Colombo, to define uh, multiculturalism. So she provides the, a clear definition here. Uh, and then she goes on to analyze each definition, right? So she looks at political rights uh, in one paragraph and compares you know, his definition to this idea of, of multiculturalism. Uh, then she looks at education, specifically from students. Uh, then she looks at uh, uh, national identity. And then she finally uh, looks at uh, not just national identity, but also this idea that there's a, a presence and upraising of multicultural groups. Um, and so both of these paragraphs touch on national identity, but in very different ways. In fact, she, she points out here that um, one person's argument fails to do something. Okay? Uh, and as she's going through the entire paper, she sort of weaves in, again, this idea of you know, what a, uh, a multicultural society does, what it doesn't do, um, how it affects different parts within them. So she looks again at national identity, political rights, and educational rights. Uh, and then, of course, in her conclusion, she weaves us all back together to address uh, the Rio Grande Valley specifically. Okay, So uh, she does that well, and she takes a lot of liberties with, with how she organizes the paper, because rather than doing uh, the five parts that I mentioned in my instructions, she combined certain parts so that they did the same thing together, which, again, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with. Uh, she does a good job of citing all her sources, so you'll notice the way that these things are cited here um, is correct. So if you're not sure about what I mean by MLA format, this is it. Usually you have the authors listed here first, uh, followed by the title of the articles in quotation marks, then the title of the journal that it came from, the volume and issue number, uh, the date of publication, uh, and finally, the DOI number. Usually, it's uh, the digital object identifier. So, uh, all four of her sources that she ends up using are all uh, recent, right? All 2015, 2016, 2015, 2015. Uh, and they're all very much relevant to what she's talking about. Um, every single source she uses to sort of paint this bigger picture of, what, of how multiculturalism works. And then, of course, she applies that idea to the Rio Grande Valley at the end. Okay, uh, So that's, uh, again, one, one sample paper that I think you guys can, can look at and study. Um, the writing is pretty good. There are some places where I thought there could have been more development, but um, I still thought it was you know, certainly worthy of an A+. Uh, a plus. Um, let's take also a look at this other student paper. This one's about uh, criminal, I think criminal justice. Um, I could be wrong if I... Pretty sure, yes, race in the criminal justice system. Uh, let's take a look also, again, at this uh, opening section. I'm not going to read the whole thing because uh, this student very much enjoys longer uh, paragraphs. But at least let's get into it to see, you know, sort of, again, um, the patterns that we're looking for. He says, as of late and often in the past, the criminal justice system has undergone close scrutiny for its alleged corruption. So already in the very first sentence, we have a few key points. We know we're going to talk about criminal justice and the system specifically, and we're going to look at corruption. But we've already hinted in the title that it's going to be about race, too. So we know that something about corruption, race, and criminal justice system, all these parts are going to work together for something. He continues, individuals hold that the criminal justice system is guilty of wrongful arrests and sentences for racial minorities. So notice, finally, we come back around and... Uh, you know, bring in this idea of corruption into something called wrongful arrests and sentences, and here we bring in this idea of race again. Because of these beliefs, animosity between two sides is born, and a question is brought to light. That question is whether or not the criminal justice system is biased in their decisions and actions towards minorities, which births a more general question of whether or not there is some oppressive entity present within the criminal justice system that is attracting all of this negative attention. Because all of these ideas are born mostly out of factual data gathered by the criminal justice system and other branches of the Justice Department, it is easy to look at research without worry of being misled by biased statements. Although other sources that interpret factual data help shed light on things that it might actually factor in on a notable scale. And then he goes on to provide some context, provide some percentages, and so on and so forth. 
But by already by halfway through this paragraph, and I think frankly he could have probably broken it up, but I, I forgave him for that. Um, already we still have a clear idea of what's going to be answered, and he already poses two basic questions, uh, and already fo tells you exactly what's going to be focused on. We're going to look at wrongful arrests and sentences of racial minorities, and hopefully we'll have a breakdown of what those are. And of course he 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 brings in. Notice he brings in research, for instance, uh, Hurwitz et al. And notice uh, he talks about his uh, article, Linked Fate and Out Group Perceptions. Uh, then he weaves in uh, someone named Saperstein and gives some information about her before introducing that article. Uh, and of course, he summarizes it, includes information from that. Uh, and then finally, of course, talks about the results, right? The data suggests that violent or drug related crimes are most often correlated with being black more so in comparison to any other race. Um, and again, he does something very similar to what um, the previous paper did, which was that they brought in a lot of information from sources first to try to make their case. Uh, and then, at the very end, try to weave together something that relates to um, their own topic specifically. Um, now, although... They do clearly use um, sources throughout the paper. Not once do they let the sources do the work for them. They are constantly, uh, both students, constantly weave together what they are arguing or analyzing with what the source is, right? So notice at one point, this student is talking about a source. It says, she also states that crimes that are committed by blacks have a much greater impact on what is perceived in future cases, right? So that is summary or that's paraphrase at least. Right. But then he goes on and sort of weaves in together with his own thing. Right. What this suggests is that it's almost criminalizing to be black. But most importantly, that society as a whole is plagued by this racialization of crime, not due to ill intent, but rather because individuals who are guilty of stereotyping others based on race and crime are doing so subconsciously with the added knowledge that those with lower levels of linked fate are less likely to realize that discrimination is present within their lives. So notice he also brings in. This idea of linked fate, which was mentioned very early on uh, in the paper, it was actually um, here, this idea of linked fate. That was from a different article altogether, uh, and now he's trying to weave together that article with this one much later. So there's obviously this connection that the student is trying to make between his sources, and that's what you need to be doing as well. When you bring in sources, it's because they're, they're talking to one another or you're showing the, the, the discourse that's happening between your sources. Um, again, you can read these uh, in a little bit more in detail so you have an idea of, of what to look for, but that's, that's the basic idea, right? Um, the literature review is gonna be one of the most key parts to the paper. If you can do the literature review well, then the rest of the paper falls, I think, pretty easily. Okay, enough about that. I do wanna talk about um, the instructions for the research presentation. Now, since you, this, this is an online class, uh, I'm not doing presentations the same way I would do for uh, a face-to-face -face class. Normally, with, with research presentations, I have my students sign up for a time, and they present in front of the rest of the class, um, and they usually have, you know, have the opportunity to, to stand in front of the classroom and present their information. Since this is online, it's going to be a little bit different, so let me try to explain what I mean here. Um, the instructions for the presentation are really basic. Essentially, you just have to create, design, and deliver a presentation based on the research paper you submitted. Um, a couple of things are important to note, and this, all, this is uh, the language that you see here in the instructions is, is taken directly from the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. They're the ones that decide what the general education classes have to do. Um, so here, your, if your presentation must have oral and visual elements, meaning that you can use any combination of text, video, and audio so long as the information is neatly organized, comprehensive, and relevant, right? Organized meaning that there's a clear you know, introduction, literature review, basically a reflection of what you did in your research paper. Uh, it should be comprehensive, meaning it covers the whole research project, not just, oh, this is what I did at the beginning and I'm done. Right. Or I'm only halfway through the research paper of project, so I'm not, I'm not going to I didn't have a chance to finish. Like, no, it has to be comprehensive. And of course, it should be relevant. 
it can't just be, oh, I'm going to present on something completely different from what I did on my research paper. Like, no, this is based on your research. I wanted to know, um, I want you to, to have the opportunity to, to present your research in another format besides an, an essay. Okay. Um, as you uh, create your presentation, you need to, of course, still cite sources as needed. So here are a few examples of, of presentations that I think you, you could do, uh, I think, fairly easily. Number one, uh, you could do a poster board presentation uh, with a lecture. Now, of course, since this is online, uh, you couldn't actually have a poster board because we wouldn't, you know, a physical poster board won't help us. But if you want to record yourself doing a presentation and upload that, that's fine. Um, if you want to do a PowerPoint, which I think is the, frankly, the easiest one, the one I did, had the most last semester. If you want to do a PowerPoint or some other similar uh, presentation tool like Prezi, you can lecture over that or, or, or do like a recorded voiceover, similar to what I'm doing right now through Tegrity Lecture. Uh, you can make an edited video. Um, if you want an idea of what that looks like, you can take a look at the student research presentation number one. That's an edited video, and I think it would be a great example of, of what I'm, I'm looking for. I only ask that you can't just be you talking to the camera the whole time, right? At least here, what I'm doing, you'll notice there's a screen um, that shows my, my computer screen, what's on my screen, and off to the side, there's a window with, um, with me in it, I think on... On, on this side over here, okay? Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you probably can't see my face. You can only see my uh, whatever's captured on my screen, okay? Um, if you'd like, you could also do something called a blog or wiki um, if you feel more comfortable with that, but of course, you'd still have to lecture on that too or any combination of the options listed above, okay? Uh, if you want some other presentation format, please get my approval immediately. Uh, now you have, you have until April 30th uh, to turn that in. That is the day after the research paper is going to be turned in. So the research paper is due April 29th. This is due April 30th, which means you should be working on both right now. You need to be working on the, the research presentation and the research paper simultaneously. Uh, that actually isn't that difficult because this, it's going to be the same information in both, right? One's going to be written in an essay format. The other is going to be just sort of uh, the nuts and bolts, uh, the, the main gist of your presentation, except you might be incorporating more images or videos or slides, whatever the case might be. Okay. Uh, one thing I should note, by the way, um, your presentation needs to be original too. Uh, you can't simply plagiarize. Um, I had a student last semester um, who simply went to YouTube, and this was a face-to-face -face class. She went to YouTube and... Um, just had us watch a video that she found that she was like, oh, this was really great for my topic, so I decided I'm going to show this. Like, no, zero. That's a zero. Um, it needs to be yours. Uh, that said, you need to shoot for about 10 minutes. Now, I'm, I'm giving you anywhere between 9 minutes and 11 minutes, not 8 minutes and 59 seconds, not 11 minutes and 1 second. You need to be somewhere between 9 and 11 minutes, okay? Of course, you need to follow the MLA format whenever you do citations. Um, any other formatting that you want, like margins, that sort of thing, don't care when it comes to uh, the presentation, so long as it's clear. Um, you're going to do the same thing that you did earlier in the semester when you uploaded a video to YouTube. Um, if you're not sure um, uh, where the instructions are, I'm going to post the instructions on how to record and upload a video to YouTube. I think that was in the week uh, seven folder, but I'll, I'll repost it to uh, the next folder. Uh, now let's talk about the rubric. Oh, before I forget, that one's going to be due uh, April 30th, just, just so you don't forget. Uh, let's go over the rubric for the research presentation. Now, normally, uh, this rubric I have in front of me in the middle of class while I'm listening to your presentation. This is going to be a little different because I'll be sitting in front of my computer with this score sheet in front of me. Um, you'll notice that there are, are three categories. We have organization, which is worth a total of 15 points. Content, which is the, the most here, it's worth 45 points, and presentation, which is worth 40. Uh, now, each piece, e each category has different scoring criteria within them, uh, each worth a different number of points. So these are just maximum points, um, totaling 100 points here. 
Um, you could get, let's say, a 3 out of 5 or a 4 out of 5 or a 5 out of 5 on the score, and then that'll get your total out of 100. Okay. So for organization, um, one of the things you should keep in mind is that the type of presentation should be appropriate for the topic and your audience, right? If you, if you want to do some sort of lesson plan, for instance, uh, but, you, but your topic isn't on education or anything to do with the classroom, that's probably not appropriate and you'd lose points here. Uh, information should be presented in the logical sequence, meaning you know, introduction, literature review, um, your argument or analysis, and then the conclusion. Right? If you start moving things around or if it's not clear where exactly you're going, you're going to lose points there. And then finally, of course, that you should cite references. Right? Um, it should be very clear that you um, include any sort of citations for uh, summaries, paraphrases, or quotes throughout the presentation. Uh, under content, your introduction should be attention getting. It lays out the problem well and establishes a framework for the rest of the presentation, uh, meaning it establishes an outline. Like, here's what I'm going to cover in the next you know, few slides or whatever. Uh, if you use technical terms, make sure you define them so that they're appropriate for the target audience, right? Most of us may not be experts in whatever discipline you're doing research in, so try to be clear about that. Uh, make sure that your presentation contains accurate information. So if you do quote, make sure you didn't change the quote severely um, and don't simply make claims. Um, I had a couple of students last semester who simply just went on rants in the middle of their presentations and their rants were not based on any real evidence. Uh, of course, make sure that any material that you include is relevant to your message and purpose and that it is prepared uh, appropriately and that any points you make reflect uh, their importance. And of course, there should be an obvious conclusion that summarizes the presentation. Okay, So altogether, this is worth, again, 45 points. Finally, we have uh, presentation. Uh, 10 points for visual aids being prepared well and informative, effective, and not at all distracting. Um, I had one student who was doing something about um, body image and more than half of the presentation was just shirtless guys and women in uh, scantily clad clothing. That was a little distracting and didn't really make the, the students point that much. Um, there, should have, there should have been more information, less you know, distracting visuals. Um, the length should be within the assigned time limits. I start taking off points the moment you go, or the further away you are from 10 uh, minutes. If you're at 10 minutes, that's a 10. If you're at 9 minutes, that's a 9. If you're at 11 minutes, that's a 9. You know, it's one point off. But you know, every time you start moving further away, you didn't quite do it. That's obviously time being lost here. Uh, and if, finally, that the information was well communicated. This is very vague. It's worth 20 points, and most people do get at least 18, 19 points under this section. Uh, you lose a lot of points. Not, I mean, if you stutter, if you... If you um, if you have a lisp or something or some sort of speech impediment or speech pathology, that's not going to count against you. This is not a speech class, and uh, th I'm not expecting you to have the best sort of speaking voice, but I do expect you to know what you're talking about and to present the information as best as possible. Um, if it sounds like, you know, if it's unclear, it sounds like you don't even know what you're talking about, you're, you're misusing terms here and there, um, you know, that's going to hurt you. Um, so clear, keep in mind that you, you should practice what you're going to present before you record. Um, sometimes, you know, when I'm doing integrity lectures, I spend uh, two, I do two or three tries. In fact, this is my third attempt tonight because I, I messed up in the first two tries. Uh, and I'm trying again now to make sure I got it right. Um, so some of these usually take some practice. Um, so don't feel discouraged if you don't get it right the first time. Uh, take your time. It's just like writing a, a draft, for instance, right? The first draft is probably not going to be your best. You're going to have to write several drafts before you really get um, uh, the goal you're hoping for. Okay, so that's that's that for the, the rubric and the instructions for the research presentation. If you have any questions about these, please feel free to, to email me um, or text me. Uh, I will have the week 15 folder up soon. That will include uh, a link to the, uh, the research paper submission page uh, as well as the presentation um, for um, uh, the, sorry, the discussion board for the research presentations. Uh, although there should be uh, 
I'll probably duplicate that one in the week 15 and week 16 folder so we have access to that. All right. If you guys have any questions whatsoever, please, please do not feel, uh, please feel free um, to reach out to me. Uh, I know it's been hectic and a lot of you are probably a little worried about your, your grades or you're, you're struggling with other classes. Um, so this is crunch time, but you, you've got to have the motivation to really keep going. So I'll be here to help you with, with anything you might need. Um, and for those of you, again, who have not emailed me last last week, we, we conferenced one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, you can check out the, the week 13 folder, and I had instructions there about what we were supposed to do. Uh, these were questions you were supposed to answer and email me um, this past Friday. I didn't hear from some of you, so please make sure that if you if you haven't contacted me, please do so we can make sure and sort you out um, to see that you're on uh, um, on the right track to finishing. Okay, um, you all take it easy.